Technology at the hospital. At the, sorry, uh, Dr. Delatorre is a professor of dermatology at the hospital Santa Casa of Curitiba in Brazil. He's a dermatologist providing dermatologic and skin cancer care, including most surgery. Also, he has developed a special research interest in the field of vitiligo. And Dr. Luisa Polo Silvera is a second year dermatology resident at the Hospital of Santa Casa in Curitiba, Brazil. She has a special interest in pursuing career in public health and is currently a Glowderm trainee volunteer. Um, welcome everyone again. Our webinar will begin shortly. Um, I just wanted to go through some meeting etiquette prior to beginning. So um, just keep in mind that your audio will be muted and, and your um, sorry, and your camera will need to be turned off for the duration of this webinar. Um, we will have a live quiz after the case presentations and talk, and you'll be able to participate anonymously using the Zoom poll function. Um, so we'll guide you through all of that. So hopefully you guys are able to stay for that. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat function. Our meeting host will share these with the speakers at the end of the webinar. And we'll also give you some information about the um, Glowdown Training Committee and our following talks at the end. So um, without further ado, I present um, low-cast accessible treatment for DeLigo, led by Dr. Delatore and Dr. Silvera. One second. It's not playing? No, I guess not. Okay. One second. Sorry, guys, just one second. Watching. And now we start with our quiz. So welcome everyone. I hope all is well. First, I would like to thank you for this invitation. It's a pleasure for Luisa and for me to be here today. And we are going to talk about Religo some are its clinical pearls and also its therapeutic uh, modalities, including more accessible ones like sunlight, photochemotherapy, for example, and also surgical therapies. We declare no conflicts of interest for this lecture. And firstly, we are starting with some clinical cases that Dr. Luisa is going to present. So good morning, everyone. My name is Luisa. I'm a dermatology trainee at the Hospital of Santa Casa de Curitiba from Brazil. And today I'll be presenting the clinical reports of our lecture. So the first case report is about a young Caucasian male, 17 years old, who presented with achromic macules surrounded by an erythematose calling halo in malar and perioral areas. His pre-medical history included a resistant acne, previously treated with topical and systemic antibiotics without response. He did not have allergies and had been taking isotretinoin for five months with a cumulative dose of 5,400 milligrams. He did not smoke nor had alcohol abuse, and he was previously healthy with no family history of vitiligo. As we can see, uh, there were achromic spots surrounded by an erythematose scalding halo in malar and perioral areas, we, which did not exceed the midline on the right side of his face. The Woods light examination revealed fluorescent chalky white aspect as well as as well as polyosis in beard hair in beard hair favoring the inflammatory segmental vitiligo diagnosis. So after the diagnosis was made, the patient was orientated to suspend the use of isotretinoin and follow the treatment with tacrolimus ointment 
0.1% twice a day. He presented an improvement of perilegional erythema after two months, and unfortunately with no improvement of acromy. Subsequently, he was submitted to 20 sessions of UVB narrowband phototherapy with little perifollicular pigmentation. It is important to mention in this case that uh, the mechanism of action of isotretinoin is not yet fully elucidated, uh, but the drug appears to play a role in triggering autoimmunity in genetically susceptible individuals. Our second case is about a 53-year-old Caucasian male who attended our service referring a chromic patches on face for five years with significant, uh, significant psychosocial distress. He hadn't had any previous treatments for his lesions, for the lesions, did not have allergies, no history of cigarettes or alcohol abuse, and also no significant medical family history. Uh, actually, this patient does not have vitiligo. Uh, his pre-medical history includes a diagnosis of subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus, which had been inactive for the past five years, coinciding with the time when the leukoderma started. He was under 400 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine, uh, once a day and had already been treated with oral cortical therapy and methotrexate. In this case, um, to improve the residual lesions, a surgical treatment with melanocyte keratinocyte transplantation procedure was proposed. And here we can see the results after five months of follow-up with a good color match and 90% of repigmentation. We believe uh, the importance of this case is to emphasize that not every chromic lesion is vitiligo, so it is always important to remember to consider the differential diagnosis. And finally, our third case is about a 31-year-old male patient who presented with a history of acromic macules and patches on his left arm distributed in a segmental form. Uh, the lesions began five years ago and had been stable for five years. Previous treatments included uh, betamethasone dipropionate cream 0.05% and tacrolimus ointment 0.1%. The patient also underwent 85 sessions of narrowband UVB therapy with only 25% of improvement. In his pre-medical history, uh, he was diagnosed with IgA nephropathy associated with hep hepatitis B and had been treated with pegylated interferon alpha 2A for five years. He ended up evolving to a hemodialysis and renal transp transplantation. The patient did not have allergies, no history of tobacco or alcohol abuse, and no family history of vitiligo. At the time, the patient was on use of Iverolimus 1 mg a day, Tacrolimus 3 mg a day, and Prednisone 10 mg a day. And here we can see the acromic patches with a blush card distribution in his left arm. Due to the risk of carcinogenesis, uh, phototherapy treatments were contraindicated and a non-cultured epidermal cell suspension procedure was planned. After the procedure was conducted, here we can see the final result demonstrating a repigmentation of 95% of recipient site after six months with a slight hypochromy. Also, with the Woods lamp examination, uh, we can identify diffuse repigmentation pattern. So thank you very much. And now Dr. Gerson will continue our presentation. So thank you.
Thank you, Luisa. Vitiligo is a chronic autoimmune disease that progressively destroys melanocytes in the skin, resulting in patchy pigmentation and leading sometimes to a great psychological stress. In average, similar to those with psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. It affects 0.5 to 2% of world population, and it's classified mainly in common vitiligo, segmental vitiligo, with this not exactly dermatomal, but segmental pattern of distribution that follows uh, classical lines, and uh, also mixed type vitiligo with segmental involvement and also features of common vitiligo together. Almost half of them uh, will appear before 20 years of age. Common vitiligo is still subdivided into generalized vitiligo, acrofacial vitiligo, focal vitiligo, causal vitiligo, and finally, universal vitiligo. The diagnosis of vitiligo is made on a clinical basis. And it's important to say that some of these presentation patterns also give us some important diagnostic and prognostic clues. For example, one sign of clinical activity is an inflammatory disease. So let's take a look at this case. Uh, this patient presented with achromic patches with erythematous disquamative borders, as we can see here. This is quite rare to see, but when present, it's a sign of truly active disease and we need to act fast. Trichrome vitiligo is another feature of an active disease. The term uh, trichrome vitiligo describes lesions that have a tan zone between normal and totally pigmented skin. This is not so obvious sometimes. And in selected cases, we can use dermoscopy as a true assessment of vitiligo stability, as we can see here in this image with more subtle trichrome findings. On fatty like lesions, as we can see here in this hand, are these pinpoint achromic lesions that also indicates rapidly progressive vitiligo. And finally, the last sign of activity is the Kebner phenomenon. Kebner phenomenon is very common over the elbows and knees, but these aren't the only places where it happens. It's also very common over tighter parts of the clothes and also scratches, as we can see here and here. And we also should keep in mind that since we often traumatize our fingertips every day, even these fingertip lesions may represent a Kebner phenomenon. Today, it's known that these patients with fingertip lesions are bad candidates for vitiligo surgery and respond worse to clinical treatments. But we also have signs of good prognosis. It's important, for example, to recognize a segmental vitiligo. These patients generally have a completely different course of their disease. Segmental vitiligo is normally a rapidly progressive variant, but stabilizes quickly, in average, in one year. So it's important to define a diagnosis like this. We also know that these patients respond very, very well to surgical treatments, but less to the clinical treatment. And they also tend to have a permanent pigmentation after these procedures. 
the importance of early treatment has been studied by several authors. In Vilaigo, we consider that time is melanocyte. We already know that those patients with long-standing disease, longer than one to two years, treated with narrowband UVB, show lower efficacy compared to patients with recent onset with LIGO. So time of treatment, it's important. The mainstream modalities of treatment are topical corticosteroids, topical calcineurin inhibitors, oral menopause therapy with corticosteroids, phototherapy, and surgical modalities. Topical corticosteroids and calcineurin inhibitors are used generally when the body surface area is smaller than 10%. The choice of which topical corticosteroid will depend on the anatomic area being treated. Corporal areas can be treated with ultrapotent or potent corticosteroids once a day. If you are treating face, neck, intertrigenal areas, or even children, it's a better option to choose mid-potency corticosteroids, or even a topical calcineurin inhibitor like tacrolimus ointment or pimecrolimus cream twice a day. Cyclical fashion regimens uh, are a good idea to prevent some side effects of topical corticosteroids. There are several regimens with days off, like one week on, one week off for six months, or five days on, two days off, uh, for example. But it's always prudent to maintain the follow-up of these patients in order to detect possible side effects of the corticosteroids. It's important also to remember that calcineurin inhibitors can be used in these days off. Okay. Uh, oral menopause with low dosage uh, corticosteroids are reserved for progressive disease. Oral menopause has the power to stabilize vitiligo in about 88% of patients. You can use dexamethasone or even an equivalent one, four milligrams in two consecutive mornings per week for three to six months. Here in our department, we prefer to not extend more than two months due to its infinite list of side effects like, like weight gain, insomnia, agitation, osteoporosis, hypertension, hyperglycemia. Uh, so we have to take a lot of care with oral menopause cortic steroids. Phototherapy with narrow band, narrow band UVB is the first line therapy for progressive disease. For vitiligo affecting more than 10% of body surface area. And also for those patients with recalcitrant lesions. It's well known that Pilvasol works less than the traditional Pilva and less than UVB narrow band, but for places without access to a narrowband UVB therapy equipment, photochemotherapy with sun exposure can, a, can be a cost-effective alternative, especially as a corticosteroid sparing agent or also a widespread disease. It can be done with 8 methoxyzoralin two times per week, two hours before exposure. The patient can expose at 10 a.m. or 4 p.m. And the patient starts the treatment with five minutes, increasing two minutes each 30 sitting, till the total of 15 minutes or minimal erythema. When using Buvasol, we have to take a lot of care with its side effects. The main one is the skin burn. 
to prevent it, first, I personally prefer to not use topical sorrelant. They present a huge risk of skin burn. Second, I use the minimum possible dose of oral sorrelant. And I prefer also to expose the patient at the afternoon because for the patient, it's easier to control the post-treatment sunlight exposure. He will have less time of sunlight in the rest of the day. And finally, I only prescribe Pilvasol for patients with good capacity of understanding it. It's very important. We also recommend for our patients to use sunscreens and to wear sunglasses for the rest of the day. It's important to remember also some contraindications of PUVA, like history of skin cancer, pregnancy, photosensitivity disorders. And finally, surgical therapy. Surgery for vitiligo is a highly effective treatment, provided that its indications are respected. Otherwise, you may harm the patient. So we have to pay close attention to its indication. Uh, first, the patient must have a stable disease with no new lesions, no increase of old ones for at least one year. Second, once we are going to cause sites of surgical trauma, patients may not have a history of Kibner phenomenon or even keloid. And third, preferably, we should choose cases resistant to clinical treatments. Basically, surgical therapy, specifically talking about melanocyte transplants, is about the transfer of melanocytes from a healthy donor area to an affected recipient area. And there are many different techniques to do that. We have tissue techniques as mini grafting with punch technique, for example, suction blister epidermal grafts, and also epidermal curatage. We also have cellular techniques as the melanocyte keratinocyte transplantation procedure, MKTP, suspension from hair follicles, and even cultured autologous melanocytes. Today, I'm going to talk about two of them, the MKTP and the epidermal curatage. Today, MKTP is the gold standard of surgical treatment of mid to large vitiligo lesions. It has the advantage of an excellent ratio of donor to recipient area. For example, with one square centimeter of donor area, you can treat up to 10 square centimeters of a recipient area. It also has a great efficacy if 70% of patients achieving 90 to 100% repigmentation. As disadvantages, you need to have some special equipments and also laboratory materials. In MKTP, first we obtain the graft. That is a very superficial partial thickness screen graft. And we do this by using a shaving blade attached to a hemostatic forceps under local anesthesia, as we can see here. After that, we incubate the tissue for around 50 minutes in trypsin. And after this time, the epidermal cells start to detach from each other and become part of the saline solution. As we can see here in this well. 
the solution is centrifuged. and transfer to syringes. After that, we prepare the recipient area. And this is done by a very, very superficial dermabrasion. Here, I'm using a rotor dermabrader. And after that, we pour the solution on the wound, as we can see here. And cover the area with a collagen sheet. Petrolatum gauze over and normal gauze over it. The dressing is kept for seven days. And here is the result after five months with almost 100% of repigmentation. Here is another patient with six months result with good repigmentation. A good alternative to MKTP for small to mid-sized lesions is the epidermal curettage. This technique is much simpler once no extra lab equipment is needed, being a very cost-effective technique. The epidermal curettage is performed on the donor area usually the sacral region, and the size of donor and recipient areas should have a maximum ratio of 1 to 4. After these areas are demarcated, they undergo antisepsis and local anesthesia, and a curettage is performed until the first sign of pinpoint bleeding becomes visible. The obtained material is placed into a sterile tube and mix it with saline until achieving a pasty consistency. The recipient area is prepared with the same technique or by the use of a dermabrader. Finally, the paste of melanocytes is placed over the recipient area, which is occluded with a semi-permeable membrane dressing that's kept in place for seven days. Here is an example of repigmentation result after three months of therapy. This recently published article also compared MKTP technique with epidermal curatage and found, found similar repigmentation results. It's a very simple and efficient technique that anyone can apply in daily practice. So thank you for watching. And now we start with our quiz. Infinite. Infinite. So hello everyone, now we're heading to the multiple choice question part of the lecture. So question number one, which of the following is not a characteristic sign of progressive vitiligo? We'll present each of you a poll, so I'll, answer, I'll ask you to answer it.
Yeah, so uh, most of you answered B, but A as well. 33% uh, answered B and 29% answered A. Uh, can you uh, uh, put the next slide, Akash, please? Yes, no, back one, yeah. So um, these are the, the lesions. The first one represents a fingertip vitiligo, uh, C, confetti-like, D, inflammatory vitiligo, and E, trichrome. So they are all characteristics of progressive vitiligo. Letter B actually was the correct answer. Segmental vitiligo is not a sign of progressive vitiligo. It is actually uh, rapidly progressive, but it has a limited course. So that was the correct answer. And most of you got it right. Let's go to the second question. Um, for this one, we won't have a poll. So I'll ask you to answer uh, by yourselves and later we'll um, tell the answer. So match the following treatments to its correct indications in the context of vitiligo. So I guess everyone has already an answer, maybe we could, yes. So um, ultra potent or potent corticosteroids as uh, Dr. Gerson said in the lecture is indicated for patients who have less than 10% of their body surface area compromised with vitiligo and in non-sensitive areas. Moderate corticosteroids or calcineurin inhibitors are indicated as well to uh, less than 10% of body surface area with vitiligo, but uh, in patients who are compromised with sensitive skin areas such as face, neck, or intertriginous, and also for children. Uh, oral mini pulse of DEXA or betamethasone are indicated for rapidly progressive vitiligo. And finally, phototherapy is indicated for patients who have more than 10% of their body surface area uh, and are recalcitrant to topical therapy and have diabetes, for example. So let's go to the qu third question. Yeah, which is not a contraindication of Puvasol in vitiligo patients. Yeah, most of you answered it correctly. Uh, the one that is not a contraindication for Puvasol is stage two chronic kidney disease. So uh, the contraindications for Puvasol are skin history of skin cancer, such as keratinocyte skin cancer or melanoma, pregnancy and photosensitivity. So most of you got it right. Let's go to the fourth question. Um, contraindications or signs uh, of poor prognosis in surgical therapy except Yeah, most of you got it right as well. Um, so the contraindication signs of poor prognosis in surgical therapy are Kebner phenomenon, calloid history, uh, increase of lesion size in the last eight months, and periungo vitiligo. Uh, actually, as Dr. Gerson mentioned, periungo vitiligo or fingertip involvement is a sign of bad prognosis in vitiligo. And no new lesions for the past year or more are an indication of stability of the disease, which indicates surgical therapy. 
So you got it right again. So the last question, please. Yeah, so the, for the fine, uh, fifth question, we have a clinical case. MPD male Caucasian shows up for a clinical appointment with you and reports having been diagnosed for vitiligo for the past for five years. He has not presented new lesions in the past year, nor has had size increase of his previous lesions. After physical examination, you conclude 25% of his body surface is compromised with achromic lesions and identify a keloidal scar on his left knee. He questions you what is his best treatment option and you answer him. Yeah, so most of you got it right again. Congratulations. The correct answer is D, phototherapy. Um, so in this question, we cannot use topical, uh, topical corticosteroids or nor topical calcineurin inhibitors because more than 10% of his body surface area is compromised and they're indicated for patients who have less than 10%. Um, our meaningful therapy with corticosteroids are indicated for uh, progressive disease and uh, the patient doesn't have progressive disease. He has been st stabilized for the past year and surgery does not fit here because he has a keloidal history. So congratulations, you got all the questions correct. And now we can head to the, question, to the questions in the, in the chat box. Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that interesting talk by Dr. Delatore and Dr. Silvera. Um, now, one of our panelists, um, Sophia, will um, you know let all the questions be known so they can be answered by the speakers. Hi, everyone. I think Sophia is struggling with her audio, um, so we can't hear her. So, Akash, do you want to maybe start working through the questions? We can see if Sophia is able to join us. Sure, of course. So the first question um, that we had was from Peter Chapa, one of the attendees. Um, how will one predict or know the patient will not have Kebner phenomenon after surgery, especially if the patient only has focal vitiligo? Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you, Peter, for your question. I think a good start uh, is to choose a patient with uh, stable disease, uh, at, le at least one year of uh, stable disease. This is the, the most important. But uh, I confess that sometimes it's difficult to uh, define stability. Uh, so uh, there is a test that you can make that it's, uh, it's called a mini graft test. In this test, uh, you make a punch graft you make a punch excision of uh, uh, skin for, from posterior ear, for example, and make a transplantation inside uh, your lesion. You can do it with a small punch of maybe two millimeters, uh, two or three of uh, grafts, uh, and wait for two or three months to create a halo of repigmentation there. If this test is positive, you can um, start your um, melanocyte transfer with more uh, security, you know? Great, thank you for answering that question. So the next question that we have is, what are the costs and viability of treatment of melanocyte keratinocyte transplant procedure, or how is the accessibility of MKPT? Okay, um, today 
uh, the procedure of NKTP, uh, that is a cell suspension of keratinocytes and melanocytes. Uh, today, uh, the process is simplified. In the past, uh, the process was much more complex. And some researcher, researchers like uh, Dr. Parsad from India, for example, he simplified the procedure. Uh, and today we can say that it's not a high cost procedure, but I know that it's time consuming. And the doctor, the dermatologist uh, must pass through a, a curve of um, learning to learn to how to obtain the graft, how to uh, handle the graft and uh, create the suspension of the cells. But it's not a, a high cost procedure. Uh, and today is more accessible. Great, thank you. Um, and then another question we have is, um, how much time does the patient need to use sunglasses after PUVA sole treatment? Every day during the whole treatment, question mark? Yes, uh, he uh, or she should use uh, sunglasses during the rest of the day. Uh, it's because of that that I prefer to make buvasol exposure in the afternoon uh, because it's less time of the sunlight to pass through. Uh, but uh, answering is during all the day after the take of the pill. Got it. Okay. And um, another question we have from Dr. Delova in, in um, South Africa is, what is your approach to the treatment of mucosal vitiligo? Um, for mucosal vitiligo, uh, especially, especially genital areas, I prefer to use um, calcineurin, topical calcineurin inhibitors. Um, because topical corticosteroids uh, makes a lot of atrophy there right? And phototherapy therapy, it's not the, the best uh, method because of uh, the concerning of skin cancer there. So I think topical calcineurin inhibitors is the best option. And, and what about for the lips they're asking? Uh, the lips, uh, I think the same thing, the, the same topical uh, calcineurin inhibitors. And for uh, stable and recalcitrant lip lesions, we can also do uh, surgical therapies, right? With melanocyte transfer, uh, with, uh, for example, suction blister epidermal grafting. That is another uh, modality of uh, skin uh, surgical treatment. Great. And then another question was, um, in what substance does the keratite sample should be transferred before transplant? Can you repeat, Akash, please? So, so in which substance is should the keratite sample be transferred in prior to being transplanted? Just a minute, Akash. Luisa, can you, can you help me with the, the question? Yeah, I think they're just asking, what do you put the sample in before you, like, what do you keep it in, like the... Oh, okay, okay. Uh, you make a, a mixture of uh, the curatage of the skin with uh, saline solution, but just a, a little amount of saline, just the uh, amount to create a pasty consistency and after that, you can transplant to the recipient area. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's what they're asking. And um, another question um, from Dr. Sidra Khan, the UK is, do you use any tools to measure impact on the quality of life? And if so, which ones? Uh, not uh, in my daily routine, okay? 
but uh, for studies, for example, we have today specific uh, uh, measuring tools like VTCOL. Uh, VTCOL, I will write in the chat. Uh, that is more specific than uh, DLKI, for example. I think it's a good tool. Okay. And um, does your approach to treatment vary depending on the patient's skin type? Um, I don't think skin type uh, impacts on the in the choosing of which method. But when treating with surgical modalities, we need to take more care with higher phototypes because of the keloid risk. Uh, so we need to go slow, more slow with uh, higher phototypes when treating with surgical modalities. Uh, maybe treat a small area first. Uh, we need to be more careful uh, with surgical, with surgery in higher photo types. Okay. And uh, the next question from Alejandro Casas Buenas was, what's your experience in treatment for vitiligo localized in hands? We all know that um, acro uh, areas uh, responds uh, respond worse than the facial areas, for example. And the reason for that is that we have more uh, less uh, melanocyte reservoir in these areas. So uh, every treatment, uh, surgical ones, clinical ones, will respond uh, worse in these areas. I think the, the treatment uh, is the approach is equal to other areas, but they uh, unfortunately they respond worse. And um, the the same person had another question. Do you do you use or recommend jack inhibitors? Uh, we have uh, some studies with uh, clinical reports uh, with jack inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't think uh, that is a consensus to use uh, these drugs for everyone. Okay, uh, we need we have some safety concerns about them. Um, they are not routine yet, but I think uh, that when they first come, the first uh, case reports, they gave us a uh, hope of more researchers to uh, the future. Okay, I think the, the future is in that way, in the way of the immunobiologics, for example, jack inhibitors, but it's not our routine today. Understood. And uh, the next question was um, from one, um, from Vineet Vaidula. Um, for a student who has vitiligo and is really interested in doing vitiligo treatment research, do you have any authors you would recommend? Or be part of a research uh, yes. as a patient? Okay. Um, I think the, the uh, most part of the trials we are going to find in USA. Uh, and I don't know if he is actually running today a trial, but uh, I think the name is John Harris. Maybe Dr. Sidra uh, knows him. I think he is uh, actually a researcher that is searching for uh, new drugs and maybe he can help. Okay. Um... And then another question was, do, does any food have any influence on vitiligo, for instance, citrus fruit? Sorry, can, can you repeat, Akash? Is there any, um, does food, like people's dietary intake affect um, vitiligo, especially citrus fruits? Uh, 
we don't don't have a a great level of evidence with this kind of uh, orientation. Uh, I think this question comes from the idea that uh, Virlago may have um, uh, may may have a start with uh, oxidant. Uh, uh, oxidative stress, okay? Um, there is a lot of studies showing that. But when we treat uh, virligo with antioxidants, we don't see that uh, response of treatment, um, uh, unfortunately. So we don't have uh, a lot of uh, level of evidence with some kind of food or some kind of anti antioxidants. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then another question that was asked in the chat was, what do you believe is the best treatment for universal vitiligo? Um, I think uh, that universal vitiligo in the beginning, uh, we should treat uh, fast with uh, immuno, immunosuppression like oral menopause of corticosteroids, um, uh, total body phototherapy to stabilize the, the disease. And sometimes we have also to uh, treat with uh, immunosuppressants. Uh, of labels, ones like uh, methotrexate, for example, uh, but it's not an easy disease to treat. Right. Thank you. And the another question um, is from Dorian Sabushimiki in Tanzania. Is there any role for dapsone for its anti-inflammatory properties in progressive vitiligo treatment? Um, dapsone, I, I have not heard about uh, it in vitiligo before. I don't think so. I don't know if anyone have any experience with dapsone for vitiligo. Okay. All right. And um, the next question is, what is the role of herpes viruses in preventing recurrence and halting progression of vitiligenous patches? I, I don't know exactly that uh, it has a directly interaction with LIGO. Maybe uh, the stress that uh, precedes uh, and herpes virus disease may also start a new lesion of LIGO, for example. So I think it's more related to stress than to the uh, herpes virus itself. Okay, thank you for answering that. And we still have a, a few more questions. Uh, another question is, um, do you have any research showing the effectiveness of herbs applied topically in the treatment of vitiligo? Can you repeat, Akash, please? Um, is there any research demonstrating a benefit to herbal topical medicines for the treatment of vitiligo? Uh, uh, for sure, we, we see a, a lot of case reports, but uh, we don't see a, a higher level of evidence from them. Right. And um, the next question was, is topical, are topical vitamin D analogs really effective in the treatment of vitiligo? Yes, I, I think the same, the same idea. Uh, we have some, some level of evidence, but it's lower than uh, cortical, uh, topical corticosteroids and topical calcineurin inhibitors, for example. Um, they are not uh, a good option. Okay. And um, the next question was, what's your experience with the use of vitamin B12 and folic acid in vitiligo? I personally, I don't have any experience with them. We see that uh, 
there's a lot of uh, uh, trials uh, with some vitamins, antioxidants, but all of them, they don't have a great level of evidence. Uh, because the LIGO is, uh, until today, it's a, a hard to treat disease. So we see a lot of uh, uh, drugs like uh, this without uh, level, high level of evidence. Uh, but I, I don't think that it works. Okay. And um, our next question was, what about micropigmentation for lipid vitiligo? Yes, it's a cosmetic option, okay? Uh, but personally, uh, you, I prefer to treat with a surgical treatment like melanocyte transfer uh, or suction blister because uh, I think it's a more natural form to obtain, again, the pigment. Uh, using uh, micro pigmentation, you are causing also a Kebner phenomenon. Uh, not Kebner phenomenon, you are causing a trauma. Uh, and you have the same risk of a transplantation procedure. So I prefer to use uh, a method that we establish again the normal melanocytes in the, that region. All right, and I think our final question um, that I have, so oh, second to final question is, what is the role of placental extracts and growth factors or platelet-rich plasma in vitiligo? Oh, uh, I, heard, I heard a lot of uh, these uh, things. Uh, mainly from Cuba, but um, uh, we also don't have uh, clinical evidence for using this, um, so we do not recommend. All right, thank you for answering that, and I believe our last question for today's talk is, do you have any experience using systemics such as cyclosporin for vitiligo? Yes, um, I, uh, this uh, last month, I attended a patient of mine with uh, atopic dermatitis and vitiligo, and he's on methotrexate, and he had a great response, uh, not only in atopic dermatitis, but also in vitiligo. So uh, immunosuppressants like methotrexate, for example, may uh, have a role uh, in the treatment of uh, recalcitrant uh, disease, like a corticoid sparing agent, okay, for case of uh, rapidly progressive disease. Uh, cyclosporine, we have some experience with patients with uh, vitiligo and psoriasis. But with cyclosporin, I never seen a response in vitiligo. Uh, but methotrexate may work. Okay, great. And I think there's one final question that just came in. So <laughs> any reason um, why the recipient site is usually left for seven days after each of the procedures? Oh, of course. Uh, we kept a dress over the recipient site to protect it because to prepare the recipient area, we need to make a abrasion there. So it's uh, to prevent uh, skin infections and to, in order to uh, keep the, your graft in the place, you should uh, keep a dress in there, okay? Uh, without changes. So uh, it's important to explain to the patient uh, that we will pass into a procedure like that, uh, that he must keep the, the dress in there. Uh, and we have some uh, mobility concerns also 
depending on the region treated, you need to keep it um, not moving, you know. Uh, so the dressing uh, has uh, its benefits. Great, thank you so much um, for answering all those questions and for the presentation. Um, you know, for the attendees, if you'd like to discuss further, feel free to email our speakers at the email addresses listed below on the on the slide I'm sharing. Um, thank you guys so much for your time and for your attendance. And um, we look forward to seeing you at our next trainee committee talk on December 16th um, on Tinia with Dr. Mah Marahata from Nepal and Dr. Bania and Shrestha, her trainees. Um, thank you guys again for attending. Um, and I believe that concludes our talk for today. Thank you, Akash. Thank you again. I hope you like it. Yes, thank you so much. It was very educational, very informative. And as you can tell, start a lot of conversation and discussion in the group. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gerson, for the availability. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.